There is an old cliche saying that pretty much every game journalist at some stage in their career has said. Oh, Sonic was great in the 90s, but he's been having a bit of a rough time since the transition to 3D. And honestly, I think the transition to 3D had nothing to do with it. As when it came to 3D games, Sonic pretty much hit the ground running with Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. Things started to go south a little bit when Sonic started trying to desperately reach out to every different audience he could because he went on to become a third-party gaming mascot, as opposed to being the mascot of his own consoles. It was safe to say that Sonic's journey across a multitude of different consoles had proven to be something of a struggle, with many bumps in the road, the biggest of which being Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, which attempted to reboot the franchise into a new direction, but was immediately rejected for its poor build quality and for being such a far cry from what Sonic ever stood for. But believe it or not, Sega managed to get back up with another mainline Sonic the Hedgehog game for 2008. Many Sonic the Hedgehog patrons had abandoned all hope that Sonic would ever get back on his feet after Sonic 06. And at this stage in the gaming world, Sonic was something of a laughing stock. So in today's video, we're looking at the Renaissance era of Sonic the Hedgehog, the point where modern Sonic finally started to develop a consistent formula. So the four games we'll be looking at today will be Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Colors, Sonic Generations, and Sonic Forces. And Sonic Lost World will be covered at a later date. So our first stop, Sonic Unleashed. I see it, I see it, and now it's all within my reach. So at the time of Sonic Unleashed, a lot of Sonic fans had already kind of jumped ship at this point, with many believing that after Sonic 06 there was no hope left for this franchise. This is not the perspective that I had at the time that Sonic Unleashed came out. See, I grew up on Sonic 1 and 2 on the Sega Mega Drive and then never played a Sonic game since that. Sonic Unleashed was my very first modern 3D Sonic game. And you know, when I got Sonic Unleashed, I didn't actually set out to get Sonic Unleashed. I wanted to trade some old PS2 games in so that I could get the Xbox 360 version of Spider-Man 3 the game. It was my dad who persuaded me to give Sonic Unleashed a try, after he'd seen it advertised on TV. So at the time I bought Sonic Unleashed, I had no idea what this franchise had been through. And this may also be why I have a slightly more lax perspective on games like Sonic 06 than a lot of other people do, is because I know know that that era did come to an end, whereas you guys were all living through it. So Sonic Unleashed had a lot to prove to Sonic fans that were very cynical after Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, but it also had quite a bit to prove to me as to whether or not I would continue to invest in the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise going forward. So Sonic Unleashed is a pretty meaty Sonic game, which has a big emphasis on globetrotting. Story-wise, like the Sonic Adventure series, this gives us a little bit of extra background on Sonic's world and how it works. Dr. Robotnik shatters the Earth into pieces to extract a life form that lives inside the Earth's core called Dark Gaia, which he uses to power Eggman Land. Sonic attempts to stop Robotnik but fails. Now exposed to Dark Gaia's energy, Sonic turns into a werehog at night time. After losing the battle with Dr. Robotnik, Sonic lands back on Earth, falling face first next to a chihuahua who's lost his memory. He joins us for the adventure and we discover new bits about him, and he kind of serves as Sonic's main companion for this game. So the two team up with Tails to put the Earth back together, restoring the power of the Chaos Emeralds, and defeat Dr. Robotnik once again. In terms of the game's aesthetic, yes, Sonic is looking a bit less lanky this time around, and Dr. Robotnik is back to looking cartoonish, with the rest of the humans. But there is one thing here that does return from Sonic 06, and that is the CGI cutscenes, and my god, these are captivating. I think whether you love Sonic or hate him, like, you gotta admit, the opening cutscene of Sonic Unleashed is incredibly impressive. I'm not gonna go much more into depth about Sonic Unleashed's story and aesthetics, though, as I've already talked quite a lot about that in another video essay. Now this may sound like your typical fairly nonsensical Sonic the Hedgehog story, but at the time it was quite different because it didn't have an abundance of different Sonic lore characters in there. The only returning Sonic cast in this game are Sonic himself, Tails, Dr. Robotnik, and Amy Rose. Not even Knuckles makes an appearance this time. As well as that, Sonic is the only playable character this time around, as opposed to the abundant nine characters that we had in Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. Now there is something of a loophole to this, as Sonic has a number of different playstyles in this game. There's a playstyle made for navigating the hub worlds in this game. Sonic's speed and abilities are very capped in this mode. These places are not designed for you to go fast, they're designed for you to explore. And there's a lot of hub worlds this time around, as you spend a lot 
lot of time traveling different continents on the Earth, as well as chatting with the locals, which works much better this time around as they've gone for more of a Pixar kind of an aesthetic this time, as opposed to realism like we saw in Sonic 06. It fits. So Sonic's main daytime gameplay in this game takes on a brand new form. Well, I say brand new, it did appear in the Sonic Rush series, but I guess brand new to 3D Sonic. As in this game, Sonic Team have taken the concept of Sonic being a fast character and really ran with it. Heh, <laughs> god damn it. With the exception of the jump and the homing attack, Sonic's skill set has been completely changed for this game. Gone is the spin dash, now replaced with a boost of supersonic speed that is fueled by the rings. Sonic's entire moveset here is designed around the concept of going fast and maintaining that speed. And a lot of Sonic's functionality for stop and go platforming has been removed. He's also able to crouch and slide under low arches. Because naturally steering a character that's this fast is difficult, he now has a nifty drift. There are sections of this gameplay where Sonic will need to realign himself with certain track elements to avoid specific obstacles, which require Require a quick step left and right. All of this comes together to create a Sonic that is faster and more bullet-like than ever before. This is no ordinary platforming game, and Sonic now has a gameplay style that not only suits him to the teeth, but is also incredibly distinctive, different, and thrilling. It really feels like in one swoop this character really got himself a new identity. But then the sun does admittedly set on that. As mentioned before, night falls, he becomes a werehog. And the werehog stages are very much more your run-of-the-mill platformer. Sonic's daytime stages feel a lot like Sonic 2, and the nighttime stages feel a bit more like zones from Sonic 1, which effectively makes Sonic Unleashed in many ways the best of both worlds. But what it's easy to forget upon playing Sonic Unleashed is that the Werehog only gets better the more you play. There are different ways throughout Sonic Unleashed that you can earn EXP, which can be spent on improving your Sonic, and you can choose between both the normal Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Werehog. But to be fair, standard Sonic is pretty powerful as it is. I honestly recommend spending those skill points on new combat moves for the Werehog, as well as a longer life bar. It can take a rather repetitive button mashing gameplay with easy death and turn it into something very satisfying. And that is something where I do understand the criticism for Sonic Unleashed Unleashed is the Werehog does stop the fast momentum of this game dead. Because much of the aim of the game for Daytime Sonic is to not lose your speed and momentum, it does make the Werehog feel almost like a punishment for progressing through the game. But really, the Werehog has a different sense of speed to it in a way. If you play it well, you can get through these levels very fast, but if you don't, they can outstay their welcome. It's kind of about how you pace your combat and your combos. Once you've leveled Werehog up, again, yes, he's a lot more fun. But I can understand why Sonic fans would object to this. A werewolf style beat em up hack and slash thing is not really what you sign up for when you buy a Sonic game. At the same time, neither are mech shooting sections and treasure hunting levels. And to be honest, I do like the Werehog about as much as I like those. So it's inoffensive to me. I've, I'm pretty lucky I like both playstyles. So Sonic Unleashed definitely has a good mix of RPG elements, racing style gameplay, and platforming. I'd say the game has a good sense of progression to it with a really good difficulty curve culminating in a great final level, but one thing that definitely halts progression is the game never really states how important the Sun and Moon medals are. There's quite an abundance of these scattered throughout stages, they're definitely much easier to find in the Werehog stages, because let's face it, everything's going past you at a thousand miles an hour in Sonic stages, you're gonna miss them there. But the game doesn't really tell you that these things are important until suddenly you end up locked out of the next world because you don't have enough Sun and Moon medals. This really punishes the player for playing through a Sonic game at a good pace. You can see the oxymoron there. And then there are the tornado stages, which are about as interactive as a DVD menu. These are basically like seven minute long quick time events. Yeah, no elaboration really needed on that, that's all there is to it. I mean, it's really lame that this just is the way it is, that the fact that it just exists. It's especially lame when you consider that they've done 3D tornado stages in Sonic Adventure 1, and they were way better than this. Absolutely no control over the plane or anything whatsoever, you just press the coordinating buttons that appear on screen. It's like the equivalent of playing Simon Says for 7 minutes in the middle of a Sonic game. Fortunately, it only happens twice, and they're pretty easy. It's difficult for me to admit that Sonic Unleashed is not perfect. Why? Because this was the Sonic game that made me a Sonic fan. This was the one that got me back into the franchise. It was after playing Sonic Unleashed and loving it as much as I did that I went back and checked out every other Sonic game that I hadn't played. Because Sonic Unleashed was, and still is, one of my favorite games I've ever played. Sure, the game is pretty inconsistently paced, 
But there's a huge sense of adventure that comes with this game, partly because the story's pretty solid, but you really get to explore these worlds while speeding through them. While maybe the Werehog is a step too far, being able to explore these hub worlds at a more gentle pace really makes you feel like you're experiencing the adventure with Sonic. And even with that said, I still enjoy the Werehog. As far as I'm concerned, Sonic Unleashed is the best damn Sonic game since Sonic Adventure 2. And love it or hate it, I think most Sonic fans agreed that Sonic Unleashed definitely put the franchise in a better direction than we'd last seen it with Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. So let's move on to the follow-up, Sonic Colors. Okay, just a disclaimer, I didn't own a Wii then, and I don't own a Wii now. But that didn't stop me from getting the chance to play Sonic Colors the whole way through. Sonic Colors very much follows in the footsteps of Sonic Unleashed with the return of the boost gameplay. However, there is no Werehog this time around. So that's it then, perfect Sonic game, just absolutely perfect. Uh... Well, one positive thing is that Sonic Colors started to really rebuild Sonic's positive reputation. This was the first critically acclaimed Sonic game in a very long time. For starters, the game is made up of nothing but the daytime stages from Sonic Unleashed. There's no big giant storyline this time around. Dr. Robotnik has built an interstellar amusement park to apologize for his previous misdeeds, but really this is a cover-up for the fact that he's taking aliens and using their power to fuel this. And it's up to Sonic and Tails to stop him. There's a definite change in tone for this one, from the voice cast to the fact that the overall writing and content of this game is definitely pitched at a more broad and younger audience. Which makes sense, I mean, he's a talking hedgehog. The story's simpler, with more of a focus on humour, and yeah, the humour is very childish this time around. It's nothing that's going to be egregious to adult players, I mean, worse come to worse, just skip the cutscenes. I mean, you're not watching a movie here. This this fits Sonic just fine. Yeah, I much prefer the over-the-top, almost kind of Ugandan blockbuster-style Sonic stories that are just really badly translated and really hilariously ill-thought-through, which play with some really surprising themes and subtext. I love those for both good and bad reasons, but in the case of Sonic Colors, while I'm very lukewarm on it, I will admit that this is a style that would suit Sonic for the foreseeable future. I'm happy to step back and just say this is for kids. As for the gameplay, it all starts off pretty promising with a really good opening level and lots of 3D space to run around in. The art style is terrific, the levels are all very distinctive and creative. This game has its own distinctive visual identity when juxtaposed with previous Sonic games, and that's something I really like. Not to mention the graphics and presentation are really respectable considering this was running on a Wii. So as for the actual meat and bones of the gameplay of this game, the cracks were very apparent from the get-go, to me anyway. Because while this game trims off a lot of fat from Sonic Unleashed, making for a more streamlined and well-paced experience overall, uh, the quality of it just isn't quite there. So one thing worth noting is that Sonic's abilities have been changed ever so slightly. You can now only do the drift when prompted. And Sonic now has a double jump, and this is because he's been more geared up to do 2D platforming in this one, because this game is mostly 2D this time around, with a sprinkling of 3D here and there. The 2D segments are the meat and bones of this game, which in my opinion is a bit of a cop-out, because I much prefer the 3D segments, even in this game. The 2D is often used for very stop and go platforming, and it really doesn't complement Sonic, because there are very small platforms that are moving around a lot and you're waiting for them to come to you a lot, and then you end up overshooting your jump because Sonic's got so much momentum now. This is a far cry from the classic Sonic games, and it feels very much like they're starting to sort of reverse engineer the modern Sonic into the classic one, and it's just not working here. I think every Sonic game needs a certain amount of platforming and interactivity, which Sonic Colors has in spade. Heck, you can even interact with the title screen. That's crazy. But the platforming needs to suit Sonic as a player character. And the kind of platforming in Sonic Colors is the kind of platforming that stops the player dead in their tracks. And this is most of the game. One cool thing that Colors introduces are the Wisps, which are the aliens that Sonic has to rescue. They also act as power-ups, allowing Sonic to do these different abilities to get through the stages. And since there's a lot of different versions of the Wisps, you can really kind of play the game in your own way, and that's a very cool thing. And use of the Wisps will give you a much higher ranking at the end of the stage. Speaking of stages, this Sonic game is quite a bit shorter than the previous ones, clocking in at about four hours long. 
There are seven acts per stage, and that sounds like a lot, but a lot of these acts only last about a minute, if that. And I've gotta say, that's kind of unsatisfying, as I definitely prefer to have a stage with a bit more substance to it. And that's kind of my issue with Sonic Colors, is that there's a lot of little tiny baby stages, and I'm not very fond of them. They're definitely not a patch on any of the daytime stages in Sonic Unleashed, sadly. Which is a shame, because it feels like the idea of Sonic Colors on paper has the potential to be a perfectly streamlined Sonic game. But that doesn't mean that Sonic Colors is a bad game. And heck, Sonic Colors does come with a decent amount of content considering its shorter runtime. You've got the Sonic Simulator, which allows you to play through more 2D block platformy levels, but with a second player. You can also choose Sonic Speed from the get-go, so you can find something that works for you. Or in this case, works better for the very stop-and-go block platforming. As well as that, for the first time in a 3D, or <laughs> mostly, 3D Sonic game, you can play as Super Sonic. And he's invincible, and he's got unlimited boost energy, and he's just great. Sonic Colors, stylistically speaking, takes Sonic in a very good direction, it's just several steps back with the gameplay, sadly. In terms of structure, it's a good evolution from Sonic Unleashed, but in terms of gameplay, it's quite a de-evolution from Sonic Unleashed. So, let's just see how things go in the next game, Sonic Generations. Sonic Generations is Sonic's 20th anniversary celebration. And it's safe to say that coming four years after Sonic Unleashed, I picked a good time to get back into the franchise and do my research, or else much of what Sonic Generations has going for it would have fallen flat for me personally. So Sonic Generations has Sonic and his friends kidnapped and flung through time and space. So Sonic and Tails need to navigate their way through their own timeline to get to the bottom of this, rescuing friends and restoring life to the locations and timelines as they go. Once again, the boost gameplay returns and it takes on a form much more akin to Sonic Unleashed. And the level design is the best it's ever been, with lots of 3D platforming that really complements Sonic's abilities. This is one of the most fun Sonic games to play in the 3D segments. Sonic feels fast, but still versatile enough to get the platforming done. But there is a second playstyle, much like what Sonic Unleashed had, with two different versions of Sonic to play as. As Sonic is joined on this adventure by himself from the past, Classic Sonic. Which I guess was a neat way of tying over the two art styles. Even if this is something of a paper-thin basis for a second playable character. And Classic Sonic plays very similar to what he did in the original Classic Sonic games. It's not spot on, but it feels authentic. The main difference is now that Classic Sonic doesn't really roll down hills very well, however he has a much more violent spin dash than ever before. There's a great deal of excitement that comes in going back to Classic Sonic locations, such as Green Hill, Chemical Plant, and Sky Sanctuary, as the modern Sonic and playing through these levels in 3D with remixed music. For me, that's definitely the most exciting part of the game. But this is of course a trip through time so we go through all of Sonic's history as both modern and classic Sonic. I feel like definitely there's more that could have been done with this premise though. 20 years of Sonic history comes together for a two hour long story mode? There are a lot of unfortunately missed opportunities but I guess it does at least stay streamlined. And there's plenty of meat to this game that you can hunker down on after completing it as well or while you're on your way. With lots of other level portals that you can play through which all have their own unique challenges. One thing this game does very well that I praised Sonic Heroes for was that Sonic Generations has a very upbeat, almost party-like atmosphere. And that's partly thanks to how well done the music is. It's all remixes of songs that we've heard before in Sonic history, and it really all feels like the definitive celebration of that. I will admit though, it was around the time of Sonic Generations that I really started to kind of pine for the additional exploration and RPG elements that games like Sonic Unleashed delivered. Sonic Generations moves at a breakneck pace and it almost feels like it's kind of over before it starts. There is a hub world in this game, but it's very, very basic. And I guess another thing I will say is having 2D sections in modern Sonic's gameplay is completely redundant now that classic Sonic is on the scene. It would have made more sense if they had just committed to modern Sonic being strictly 3D and classic Sonic being strictly 2D. Sonic Generations is an example of where playing it safe really works and can be a welcome change of pace for an anniversary event. This is very fitting for Sonic's 20th anniversary. And for what it is, if you accept that it is a smaller game than previous Sonic games, Sonic Generations is still terrific. So there's just one more game left before we look at the final scoreboard, to see how these games stack up. So our final stop is... 
Sonic Forces. Sonic Forces was 3D Sonic's debut onto consoles such as the PS4, the Nintendo Switch, and the Xbox One. With new hardware capabilities come new opportunities. But rather than embrace this, Sonic Forces instead decides to play it safe, repeating the tricks from its playbook that proved popular in the past, but teaming that with a new story and one new playstyle. To its credit, the storyline tries to go bigger this time. The over-the-top, cheesy blockbuster spectacle of, say, Sonic Adventure 2 is back, but now it is ramped up to 100 as Dr. Robotnik and his alliance of familiar enemies have successfully taken over the world. And it's on the alliance of familiar Sonic characters to take back the world from the clutches of Dr. Robotnik. Now that sounds like a cool premise, but trust me, it's not as cool as it sounds. I really did like the idea of Dr. Robotnik just waking up one morning and deciding, fuck it, let's make 10 Death Egg robots and just trash up the place. Enslave everybody, why not, you know? You've got all these inventions, so why not just use them all at once? Big assault. But no, that's not the case. It more stems on Dr. Robotnik assembling a team of familiar Sonic foes, including Chaos, Zavok, Metal Sonic, Shadow, and the new character, Infinite, to ambush Sonic and, well, to the knowledge of his friends, kill him. And because Sonic's friends are completely useless without Sonic, it all goes to shit. And they form this kind of underground alliance to crush Dr. Robotnik once and for all, and my god, the wartime dialogue in this game is absolutely hilarious. Knuckles is the leader of this alliance, and he takes his job so seriously, I just, I can't take him seriously. So obviously Sonic isn't dead, he's just been in prison for six months being tortured. We don't know how and with what methods, but he just is, I guess. <laughs> tortured... <laughs> It doesn't belong in a Sonic game. And as I've mentioned, this plot has an alliance of different Sonic villains from the past, but there's not really any payoff for any of them. They're all just illusions. You get to fight Metal Sonic and Zavok, Chaos is killed off in a cutscene, they make a pretty big deal of Infinite and you do fight him three times but it amounts to absolutely nothing. So there's really no actual satisfaction to be had with the storyline here and that's not a big deal because I'm not playing the game for its storyline. There's a lot of spectacle going on and I think some of the really hilarious, ironic war dialogue from Knuckles and the other characters will go on to be quoted for decades to come. In terms of gameplay, Sonic is using the boost formula once again, but it's much closer to what it was in Sonic Colors with the double jump and the complete emission of the drift. And there's one major flaw of this gameplay, which I'll go on to mention in a bit, but first I just want to cover the other playable characters in this game. Once again, classic Sonic Returns, who's no longer Sonic from the past, but Sonic from another dimension. Weird retcon, but okay, I guess. However, his controls are, oh, they're much worse than they were in Sonic Generations. Jesus Christ. He is heavy, he's slippery, yet his jump is floaty. Classic Sonic is just an all round shit show, and it's just made worse that he shouldn't be here in the first place because he has absolutely no significance on the storyline. He's just, he's here to help. But, but that's all, he's just, he's there to be on posters, basically. Then there's the third playable character, who's a rookie, applying to aid the Alliance to crush Dr. Robotnik. And this rookie is whoever you want him, her, or them to be. As the game has a built-in character designer, with a lot of different options. And throughout the game, you can unlock an absolute abundance of accessories for this character. You can choose the species, the voice, the finale pose, everything. This character plays like modern Sonic minus the boost, but also has a gadget called the Wispon, which are Wisp-inspired weapons, get it? The Wisp, Wispon, you, ugh. A lot of them are very stop and go, and a lot of them really gunk up the controls a lot, so I just tend to stick to the flamethrower. You can also use the Wispons to get Wisps to make explosions in the air, I don't care. I barely used it, I just played the game like a normal person. Like, the Wisps were part of Sonic Colors' whole appeal, so it's kind of weird that they're just back here. There's also a grapple gun, but you really rarely get to use it. It's there to kind of give yourself your own little homing attack, but with anything interesting with the grapple gun, you don't really get to control it yourself. Heck, the grapple gun has a drift, but you only drift when the game says you can, and you don't really get a choice. Sonic forces you to drift. But the drift is really just one of many scripted events throughout this game where you can basically take your hands off the controller and just watch it for a while. And there is an abundance of this. And considering there are only 30 levels in the game, and most of those levels only last around about one minute, there's a surprising amount of Sonic Forces that you don't actually get to play. Like, an egregious amount. Okay, so here's that little character flaw I was mentioning earlier, and the reason I didn't mention it earlier is because this applies to all of the characters. 
The momentum is no longer a gradual build-up. There's a slight gradual build-up and then it's sudden puffed into full speed. Yes, even for classic Sonic. And it makes it hell to determine your jumps. So really, there's everything wrong with Sonic Forces in many ways. But what's also weird is how redundant some of these levels are. You play through Green Hill and Chemical Plant again. We played them in Sonic Generations. We played them in Sonic Mania. We played them in the original games they're based on. We played them in the Lego spin-off. Why did they feel the need to do this again? To a less egregious extent, the Death Egg is back, but I must admit I really like how it's been designed here. And there's a level called Metropolis, but it's not Metropolis, so fair enough. And the game also clocks in at under two hours this time. The music is great, the presentation's really clean, but on a whole, this does not feel like a triple A game. This is... This is definitely a double A budget game, which is also evident because it never released full price either. And with that in mind, it's kind of not so bad, I guess. I mean, there's something to be said for a game that expects very little of its player. You can pick it up, you can have a quick breezy play, it's fun, I guess. Maybe this is the kind of juxtaposition they wanted for Sonic. Like, for example, you had Mario Odyssey released the same year, a game that's incredibly interactive, a game with a lot of attention to detail, a game where there's a lot expected of the player. Maybe Sega was just like, yeah, Sega does what Nintendo don't, so we just make a really quick game that you can just have a quick play with and feel a teeny bit satisfied with, I guess. The best way to play Sonic Forces for me is to just play it all in one sitting. It really doesn't take long and it's really the only way you're going to get any substance out of your sit down. As well as that, individual levels just don't have very much replay value either. So you might as well just play the whole thing. Otherwise, there's very, very little reason to go back to it. The really sad thing about Sonic Forces is kind of just remembering where Sonic came from, and it's hard to ignore when this game features classic Sonic. This game spends a lot of its time hearkening back to classic Sonic days, reminding us of the little Mario buster that this character was supposed to be. And Sonic Forces feeling like a little double-A budget title really just feels like Sonic has given up at even trying to compete with Mario now. And that's just... That's just sad. The whole first level and the first impression of this game really sums up everything that's wrong with it. Remember Green Hill Zone in Sonic 1, how it was like this little playground where you could really just practice Sonic's different abilities with different structures and different kinds of obstacles you'd be facing in the game ahead. It gave you a little taste of everything that this character has to offer. In Sonic Forces, you're back in Green Hill Zone again at the very start, but it's chock full of just long, empty pathways with nothing to do, and scripted events where you can just stick the controller down. It's like the complete opposite. And that is just a damn shame. What I will say is, if you're thinking of getting Sonic Forces, obviously wait for a bargain, but do consider getting it on the PC, I would say. Because when it comes to PC Sonic games, there's quite a big modding community that have very enthusiastically really remedied a lot of the problems with Sonic Forces. There's a mod with reimagined versions of the Sonic Forces levels, which really brings a little bit of life back to the overall structure of these levels. There's now a lot more you can interact with and play with. Right, so those are the four Renaissance Boost Era Sonic games. It would certainly seem with Sonic Forces that the Renaissance Era has come to a close. With that said, the wait between Sonic Forces and the next Sonic game has been a long one. In fact, it's still going on. So maybe there's a lot of franchise maintenance going on behind the scenes, who knows? Right, so let's do the ranking then. In fourth place, we have Sonic Forces. Definitely my least favorite of the modern Sonic Renaissance games. In third place, we have Sonic Colors. In second place, Sonic Generations. And in first place, Sonic Unleashed. It almost feels like every time they really started doing something well, they took a few steps back with other things, and it all kind of culminated with Sonic Forces, where everything just feels like a downgrade from what's come before. It's one thing to repeat the same old tricks twice, but another thing entirely to do them worse. But if it gives you any solace, think about this. History can be kind of cyclical when it comes with Sonic. Look at it this way, in 1996, Sonic and Mario both released two new games onto new hardware. Super Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64, and Sonic 3D Blast on the Sega Saturn after a little bit of a drought of Sonic games. And Mario absolutely humiliated Sonic that time around. Super Mario 64 is considered a classic. Sonic 3D Blast? It was backwards even at the time it came out. It was basically dead on arrival. But then after a long period of no Sonic games, Sonic came back with a new identity and the Sonic Adventure series. So consider this, Sonic and Mario once again released opposite one another on new gen consoles at the time. 
Sonic Forces opposite Mario Odyssey. Mario Odyssey is an absolute goliath of a game, and Sonic Forces is, again, it really doesn't make any use of the new opportunities it's presented with. So if history is anything to go by, hopefully we've got the next Sonic adventure on our hands next time around. So that concludes my retrospective on the main series Sonic games, but that doesn't mean I'm done. There's always going to be more to look at when it comes to Sonic the Hedgehog, so I'll see you guys next time. Well, now I hand it over to you, fellow home dogs. What do you guys think? And if you did enjoy this video, might I ask you a favor? Please hit subscribe and that notification bell as your way of telling YouTube keep it coming. Likes are also highly appreciated. Now, I'm always trying to make my content better and more consistent, but this does come at a financial cost, and ad revenue isn't always going to cover putting a roof over my head and covering the subscription fees for the software I use to make these videos. So if you really enjoy this content and you feel like lending me a hand by any chance, I would be so grateful if you would consider joining my Patreon, which will also give you access to the Channel Pup official Discord server. I also have a written blog called Dr. Blogtopus over on channelpup.net. That is where I put my more critical and analytical stuff. And in the description below are links to different social media platforms where you're more than welcome to come and interact with me. So that's it for today, fellow home dogs. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on another video.